Shalom. Today we are going to talk about the milk and the meat. We're going to view this subject from two aspects. One is the Torah, the Old Testament, and the other is from the New Testament. If you are familiar with traditional Jewish cooking customs, they all stem from this verse, which appears in these three places in the five books of Moses. Exodus 23, 19. The first fruits of, the, of your land you shall bring into the house of Jehovah your God. You shall not boil a, a young goat in its mother's milk. From this commandment derive many other rabbinical commandments. We don't eat milk and meat at the same time. If milk products are taken, we wait 30 minutes before eating meat products. If meat products are eaten, we wait six hours before eating milk products. Milk and meat require separate cooking and eating utensils. In some places, they require separate refrigerators, and there's very specific rules for if you want to, what is called re-kosher the pot or the pan, you want to change it from milk to meat, then usually they allow for a dishwasher to accomplish that task. But before there were dishwashers, there were many other rules for changing those over. And what about chickens? Chickens don't give milk. However, they are included in the prohibition. Now Maimonides specifically addressed the chicken dilemma. He wrote, as behold, chicken flesh with milk is a rabbinic ordinance, that is, in order to distance us from sin. So we have this concept of a fence around the Torah. If the Torah says one thing, then we make a broader circumference away from that specific law so that we surely will not transgress the specific law. Uh, another example of this, which I've talked about elsewhere, is not taking the Lord's name in vain which we find in the Ten Commandments. And the rabbinical injunction is against ever saying the Lord's name at all. So if you never say it at all, you'll never say it in vain. This is building a fence around the Torah. Maimonides is saying that the rabbis have deemed chicken to be flesh in order to build a fence around the biblical injunction. And in the Torah, only the flesh of beasts and animals was forbidden. But the sages forbade chicken flesh in order to distance us from the Torah prohibition. And among them is one who does not ordain this ordinance, as Rabbi Yossi Hagalili, who was a first century rabbi, would permit chicken flesh with milk, and all the people of his city would eat it, as is made known by the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat. So Maimonides is a 12th century commentator. As for the prohibition against eating meat boiled in milk, it is my opinion, not improbable, that, in addition to its being undoubtedly very gross food and filling, idolatry had something to do with it. Perhaps such food was eaten at one of the ceremonies of their cult or one of their festivals. So Maimonides was not only a biblical commentator, but he was also the chief physician, I believe, to the king of Spain in his time. He was a very knowledgeable man. And so his comment about the food being gross and filling he has understood this from a medical perspective. The idea of this being attached to a pagan fertility rite is something that perhaps you have already heard, that if you took the baby from the mother and the milk from the mother, that the mother would go into another fertility cycle and thereby be able to reproduce again. There were some ancient tablets that were found and initially translated to purport this argument. However, the person who translated them filled in some empty spaces with the words he thought were appropriate, and this was later disproved. Jacob Milgram, who is a very well-known Bible commentator, has written extensively about the history of the interpretation of this commandment of not boiling a kid in its mother's milk, and I will put the link for his article in the description below if you want to read the whole article. Some of the things he has written, the nursing kid prohibition so interpreted would thus be closely related to the command to refrain from sacrificing a newly born animal during the first week of its life, which are commandments in Leviticus 22 and Exodus 22. The basis for this command is a principle of animal husbandry that would have been well known to the agricultural Israelites. Philo of Alexandria, who is a first century Jewish commentator, explained it this way. 
So these are Philo's words. During the first week after the birth of its offspring, the mother's udders are a true fountain, but the mother has no young ones to suck when one removes them, that is, the young ones. Since the milk finds no more exit, the teats become hard and heavy, and by the weight of the milk stuck inside, they begin to hurt the mother. So this is just a kindness to the animal that you don't take the sucking baby away. Furthermore, he wrote, it is grossly imp improper that the substance which fed the living animal should be used to season or flavor it after its death, as Milgram comments. Hence, according to Philo, the root rationale behind the kid prohibition is its opposition to commingling life and death a substance which sustains the life of the creature, that is the milk, should not be fused or confused with a process associated with his death, and that would be cooking. Thus, the life-giving process of the mother bird hatching or feeding her young should not be occasion for their joint death. There's a prohibition in Deuteronomy 22 about taking the eggs and the mother at the same time out of the nest. The sacrifice of the newborn may be inevitable, but not for the first week while it is constantly at its mother's breast, and never should both of the mother and its young be slain at the same time. By the same token, the mother's milk, the life-sustaining food for her kid, should never become associated with its death. And this explanation is much more in consonance with other injunctions in the Torah about not mixing things or about the emphasis of life over death. To get a better look into the New Testament problem, we're going to do some linguistics. It is true that the rabbis have compared the Torah to milk. Why are the words of the Torah compared to water, wine, and milk? These three liquids may be kept in cheap vessels, and the words of Torah are retained only by those who are humble. Alternatively, the Torah is likened to water, wine, and milk, because just these three liquids are spoiled only by diversion of attention. So, too, are Torah matters forgotten only through diversion of attention. If water, wine, and milk are guarded, they will not spoil or have dirty objects fall into them. It is also customary of eating honey and milk on Shavuot because the Torah is compared to honey and milk as it is written, honey and milk are under your tongue from the Song of Songs. Shavuot is the holiday when the Israelites received the Torah and one of the traditions is to stay up all night and eat milk products including cheesecake and ice cream and things like that. Additionally, the Torah is compared to milk, and the gematria of the word chalav, the Hebrew word for milk, is 40, signifying the number of days and nights that Moshe spent on Sinai. I'm not saying that these are valid reasons, but these are the reasons that the, that the rabbis use for comparing Torah to milk. Now, there's a 13th century book of customary rituals, which is called Shulchan Aruch, and somebody made an abbreviated version called Kitzur Sur Shulchan Aruch in the 19th century. And this quote is from there. On the first day of Shavuot, it is customary to eat dairy foods. There are several reasons for this. A hint of this custom is found in the words Mincha Chadasha Lashem Techem, which means a new offering to Hashem on your Shavuot. The initials of these words spell Mechalav, which means from milk. You should also eat foods with honey because a Torah is compared to milk and honey. As it is said, honey and milk are under your tongue. Now, since we eat dairy foods, and we must also eat meat, because it is a mitzvah to eat meat on every Yom Tov, on every holiday, care must be taken not to violate the law of mixing of dairy and meat food. So even though we're going to eat them both, because Shavuot tells us about Torah, and Torah is like milk, but it's a holiday, so we're going to eat meat, but he again emphasizes we don't mix these foods. The important thing to understand is that the Torah is like milk. Now the word for flesh, for meat, in Hebrew is basar, Genesis 2.21. And Yehovah God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place, Genesis 6.12. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. A derivative verb with the same root means to announce good news. 2 Samuel 1.20 Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, 
lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. This verse you probably know, Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good news, who proclaims salvation, and says to Zion, your God reigns. So this is in a verb sense. The noun for good news is besora, same root. 2 Samuel 4.10 When somebody told me, saying, Look, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good news, I arrested him and had him executed at Ziklag, the one who thought I would give him a reward for his news. 2 Samuel 18.22 Then Achimaz, the son of Tadok, said again to Yoav, And whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. And Yoav said, why will you run, my son, since you have no news ready? You have no good tidings. Now, what is the connection on the surface, in the initial level, between flesh and good news? The point is that flesh should be fresh. It should be new. You don't want to go to the meat market and buy yesterday's meat, especially in some countries where that meat is probably covered with flies. Gross. Now we also know that this good news is the good news of Yeshua the Messiah becoming incarnate. He becomes flesh. And so we see in John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Greek word for flesh here is sarx. I've highlighted it for you. So if we look in the Septuagint, we find in the previous two verses quoted in Genesis, talking about flesh, we see that word sarx again in the Greek. It means flesh. Now there's a difference between those who take milk and who take meat. First Peter 2.2 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Babies put everything in their mouths. This is their way of interacting with the world. They cannot express themselves, but they want to know everything that's going on, and they put things in their mouth. As you grow, you need to develop your other senses. Ephesians 4.14 4, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. A baby may put something in his mouth and it tastes good, but it might be poison. So we need to have our other senses developed. All the senses apply to our spiritual senses, sense of taste. If you indeed have tasted that the Lord is gracious, 1 Peter 2, 3. In Psalm 34, 8, it says, taste and see that Jehovah is good. Your sense of hearing. In Isaiah 55, 3, hear and your soul shall live. In Revelation 2, 7, he who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit is speaking. It's not speaking about your regular ear, your biological ear. Sense of sight is written in Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes that I might see wondrous things from your law. From Ephesians 1, 18. The eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. Sense of smell. Isaiah 11:3. He shall be of quick scent in the fear of Jehovah. Philippians 4.18, I am full having received from you a sweet smelling aroma. So interestingly, one of the features of Messiah as understood by the rabbis is that he will, is that he will have a very acute sense of smell. This is based on the verse of Isaiah 11.3 where it says, He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide with the hearing of his ears. Finally, the sense of touch or feeling from 2 Kings 22, 19, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord. You could feel things in your heart. In Ephesians 4, 18 and 19, the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to licentiousness. Over and over again, it speaks about the hardening of the heart. We need to have a sense of feeling in our heart that is developed by maturity. And so we see about the milk and the meat being spoken of in Hebrews 5. The author says, Seeing you are dull of hearing, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need milk, 
and not strong meat. The difference here is that the baby must have milk. He must be able to digest what is digestible to him. He has no teeth. He can't chew food. And these are the simple things. These are the first principles. The author of Hebrews is saying these are the first principles of the words of God. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. What did we see previously? The babe is tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now if the Torah is the milk and the gospel is the flesh, this speaks a great deal to us. Here is a chart. It says that 33% of New Testament references come from the Old Testament. You cannot understand everything you're reading in the New Testament unless you have a foundation in the Old Testament. Particularly if you look at the book of Revelation, it says 150% of the references. There are more references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation then there are verses. That means there's multiple references in many verses. If we really want to understand what is the gospel, what is the good news, we must know the Old Testament. Until next time, Tosimita Enayim, Al Hashemayim, keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.